Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Messina, President and CEO of Richmond University Medical Center. It's no surprise that the COVID-19 pandemic has made this past year challenging for all of us. Since last spring, when the pandemic began, Richmond University Medical Center has been at the forefront of the battle, providing the latest medically proven evidence-based treatment and medications, increasing positive outcomes among our COVID-19 patients. Since last spring, the dedicated staff here at Richmond University Medical Center have treated and discharged over 2,800 COVID-19 positive patients. Now, with the arrival of vaccines, granted emergency use authorization by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the end of the pandemic may be in sight. We continue to administer vaccinations to more and more individuals each week as we all work together to protect our family and our community. The arrival of these vaccines have understandably led to questions about their safety, their creation, and who should get vaccinated. To address many of the questions people such as yourself may be asking, I will be joined by our Chair of Medicine, Dr. Philip Otterbeck, and the president of our medical staff and doctor of family medicine, Dr. Marianne LaBarbera. Our goal with today's discussion is to provide you with answers to questions for yourself and others may have relative to the issue of vaccinations. We want to have as many facts as possible when your time comes to get a vaccine. Dr. Otterback, Dr. Lovabera, thank you for joining me today. Uh, let's jump right in on some questions. Dr. Otterback, are COVID-19 vaccines safe and can you briefly walk us through the process used to approve these vaccines? Thanks for the question, Dan. You know, COVID-19 vaccines are very safe. At the moment, we have actually two COVID vaccines that are approved. One is on uh, precipice of being approved from Johnson & Johnson, the two currently approved the Moderna and Pfizer. No steps were skipped in the safety, safety analysis of these, of these uh, vaccines. They went through phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. These are rigorous trials mandated by the FDA. Uh, phase one and phase two trials are all about the safety of the, of the vaccines. Phase three is about the, mostly about the efficacy of the vaccines. And these, 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 uh, these vaccines passed all of those steps as any other product would before FDA approval. All right, we're going to go right through these questions. These are the hot topics uh, when it comes to vaccines. Dr. Lababera, can the vaccines give people COVID-19? No, there's no way for the um, vaccine to give people COVID-19 because it's not co containing a live virus. Continuing our questions, Dr. Arterback. What are the possible side effects of the vaccination? So right after the vaccination, um, it's possible to get a few side effects to the vaccine. Most commonly, people are complaining about some muscle pain at the area where the, where the injection happened. But it's also possible to get a few other uh, side effects. Uh, usually, the way a vaccine works is it stimulates the immune system. And that process of immune system stimulation can result in some fevers, chills, diffuse muscle aches, uh, fatigue. Uh, and these symptoms can last typically less than a day, sometimes up to, up to 24 to 48 hours. And these symptoms can emerge up to two to three days after the vaccination happened. But the, generally speaking, these symptoms are mild and, uh, and resolve on their own without treatment. Dr. Lobavera, if someone had COVID-19 and recovered, should they still get the vaccine? Yes, they definitely should get the vaccine. Studies have shown that um, people can still get reinfected with the um, COVID virus. Therefore, if you've already had the infection, you should wait till you're completely recovered and then you can get the vaccine. If you have received monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma, then the recommendation is that you wait 90 days until you get the vaccine. All right, when it comes to ages, um, Dr. Otterbach, can children get vaccinated? 
So unfortunately at the moment, children are not able to be vaccinated. There's no vaccine that's approved for children under the age of 16 years. Hopefully, uh, and I know that the clinical trials are currently ongoing, uh, children are being studied for, for this vaccination, and I'm hopeful that uh, as time passes, we will be approved for children at, um, in the future. All right, the issue of underlying conditions. Uh, Dr. Lava Barra, is it safe for a person with underlying medical conditions to get a COVID-19 vaccine? Absolutely. Um, anyone with underlying medical conditions definitely should get the COVID vaccine because they are at the highest risk of severe complications, hospitalization, and even death. As long as you are not allergic to any of the components of the vaccine, you definitely should get it. On the subject of multiple shots, Dr. Adebeck, why do people need two COVID-19 shots? Well, a lot of that goes back to how the, how the shots were studied, right? In the, and that's why these clinical trials were so robust. Uh, and in the clinical trials, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine were both studied in two doses. The idea in concept is, is this, you give the vaccine, it stimulates an immune response. And then the second dose is a booster shot to ensure that the patients achieve appropriate levels of immunity. This is how they were studied, and this is how they're given. So once we get vaccinated, is it still necessary, Dr. Adebeck, to uh, continue to social distance and wear a mask? Yes, it is. Um, for now, it is still mandatory to wear your mask and socially distance. Reason being is that when people get infected, the way a vaccine works is it provides immunity once a person is exposed to a virus. And uh, even people that are uh, have been vaccinated or had previous COVID infection, they may maintain live virus in their nose and then they can potentially pass that to other people. So uh, until we achieve herd immunity, it remains critical that we wear our masks and socially distance. And once herd immunity is achieved, those approaches, uh, the, the masks and social distancing will be able to be relaxed. So with the rollout of the vaccine, obviously uh, restricted to certain classes of individuals, uh, when will the general population uh, be eligible for the vaccine, Dr. LaBaber? So the main issues around um, achieving full vaccination of the general public are related to supply of vaccine and also people to administer the vaccine. So the general public will likely not see um, adequate amounts of vaccines available to them until the um, summertime. So flipping a little bit over to the issue of pregnancy and breastfeeding, is it safe to get the vaccine, Dr. Otterbeck? Yeah. Um, in terms of the studies, the studies did not include uh, pregnant women uh, as a group that they were specifically monitoring. There were people during the clinical trials that were pregnant that, get, that, uh, that did get the actual vaccine. There is no reason to believe, based on the components of the vaccine, that there should be any problems with either pregnancy or breastfeeding moms. The way this, 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 this vaccine works, remember, is to make your body make an immune response to a spike protein, which is the top of the virus. There is no reason to believe that stimulating an immune response to that particular protein should cause a problem for pregnancy or in terms of breastfeeding moms. It is, would be much more dangerous for patients, for instance, to get COVID-19 um, and, uh, and therefore, the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology do recommend uh, that, that pregnant, people, pregnant individuals get, get, uh, get the COVID vaccine. Another important question is the issue of Pfizer versus Moderna. Uh, Dr. LaBavera, which is better? So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are very similar. Um, their ability to um, create immunity in people is very similar, um, the efficacy being for the Pfizer vaccine, 95%, for the Moderna, 94%, which is really not very significant at all. So then we have the issue of mutations and uh, some of what we're hearing out of Brazil and South Africa. Uh, Dr. Otterbeck, are the vaccines effective against these new mutations? So this is a certainly an active area of scientific, uh, scientific research. Uh, the audience will is certainly aware that uh, there are uh, some some of the companies are actually creating booster shots uh, uh, 
that will be able to prevent individuals from getting infected with the newer variants. But the, the promise of these vaccines, even the current vaccines that we have, is if in, an individual gets the vaccine and then they get exposed to the virus, and even if they get clinical illness, that clinical illness will be much, much less than if, being as they've gotten the vaccine uh, if they've been, versus if they haven't gotten the vaccine. Remember, vaccines are not only indicated to prevent illness, but, but and, and certainly we've seen with COVID a variety of different presentations. We've seen people get sniffles, and unfortunately, people get severe pneumonia and die. So the idea would be not necessarily to prevent all the clinical illness, but prevent people from getting severe illness and ultimately uh, progressing uh, to the point of death. And those are the people that we really, really want to focus on, especially those with the older, the older people with the most comorbidities. So the, the issue of uh, the uh, how long will the vaccine last, and will we need another boost the next year? Dr. LaBavera, can you address that for us? Sure. Um, certainly right now we don't have enough data to know how long the um, vaccine will actually protect us. Um, it may be possible that it will be like influenza vaccine, which may be changed every year a little bit, and we would need an annual booster. It's really too early yet to determine um, what we're going to need. So now we're going to address uh, some myths and concerns and some misconceptions, and we're going to do it in a kind of a lightning format. So I'm just going to ask uh, both of you, if you wouldn't mind, to kind of give us, uh, you know, five second answers, one word, or five second answers. Uh, so um, I'll kind of open it up. Uh, Phil, are COVID-19 vaccinations free? They are free. Um, no charge to the patient. Dr. Lobebera, do the vaccines alter your DNA? Absolutely, they do not alter your DNA. Dr. Adebak, do the vaccines contain tracking devices from the government? No, uh, there are no tracking devices in, 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 these, uh, in these vaccines. So the born identity, we've all seen that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lobaber, is it true uh, you can't get the vaccine if you have food or seasonal allergies? No, that's not true. The only time you can't get the vaccine is if you have severe allergies or if you had um, allergic reactions to components of the vaccine itself. So in the area of reactions and severe reactions, including Bell's palsy, is it true, Dr. Otterbeck, that on rare occasions you can see those side effects? On rare occasions we can see those side effects. On rare occasions we can also see a severe allergic reaction. There are very, very few and far between, and we, we believe that the the, the, the benefit of the vaccine dramatically outweighs those very, very, very small risks. In the area of fertility in women, can the vaccines cause infertility in women? No, there is no scientific data that links infertility in, in women and the COVID vaccine. Uh, Dr. Arterback, can the vaccines cause a person to receive a positive COVID-19 PCR test? Nope. Um, the, the vaccine is get, making a immune response to a protein. There is no way for that to elicit a, a, a vir virus in the nares. There is no virus in the vaccine. Getting a little high tech here. Is it true that messenger RNA technology used to develop the vaccine is new? Actually, messenger RNA technology has been in development for many years, um, even decades. Um, just recently, however, it was adapted to use it against the COVID-19 um, virus. So one of the questions we've all probably had uh, was, you know, the speed at which these uh, drugs have uh, come to market, the vaccinations, you know, are they safe? Uh, was the process rushed through uh, skipping steps? No, there were no skip steps. And I think what's exciting about this, it just shows us what we can all do together as a team. With the best minds in the world work for something. We have the support of the government. We have support of individuals that are looking to go into clinical trials. The fact that we can do this and make a safe, efficacious vaccine so quickly is really a testament to the worldwide effort that went into this. And last but not least, Dr. Lobavera, is it true that after you receive the vaccine, you need to wait 15 to 30 minutes to be monitored? Yes, that's true. You should wait um, 15 to 30 minutes to be sure that there are no reactions to the vaccine. And let me thank you both in wrapping it up, uh, both for your incredible support and your, your patient care. 
in helping uh, Richmond University Medical Center lead a, a tremendous effort to combating COVID-19. Thank you both very, very much. In closing, many thanks to Dr. Otterbeck and Dr. Lobavera for providing their knowledge and expertise. I hope we've been able to answer some of your questions regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. For the latest information on our vaccine program, to schedule appointments, and for up-to-the-minute information on COVID-19, please visit our website at www.rumpsysi.org. You can also check the websites for the CDC, New York State Department of Health, and New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for the latest COVID-19 information. Please remember to practice social distancing, wear a mask, wash your hands, and please, when the opportunity comes, get vaccinated. Thank you for watching.